Hello, I have a Client Who listeners, Ruth Werner here, and I'm so excited to let you know that my library of online self-paced continuing education courses has just expanded. I now have a two-hour ethics course called A Doctor's Note is Not Good Enough and What is Better. This NCB TMB approved course goes into why a doctor's permission or approval or even a prescription doesn't provide the legal or safety protection you might think it does. Then we look at how to start useful conversations with healthcare providers that will actually get us to safe and effective massage for our clients with complex conditions. Visit my website at ruthwerner.com for more information and to register for A Doctor's Note is Not Good Enough and What is Better. Hi, and welcome to I Have a Client Who, Pathology Conversations with Ruth Werner, the podcast where I will discuss your real-life stories about clients with conditions that are perplexing or confusing. I'm Ruth Werner, author of A Massage Therapist's Guide to Pathology, and I have spent decades studying, writing about, and teaching about where massage therapy intersects with diseases and conditions that might limit our client's health. We almost always have something good to offer, even with our most challenged clients, but we need to figure out a way to do that safely, effectively, and within our scope of practice. And sometimes, as we have all learned, that is harder than it looks. For today's episode, listeners, we have a really special treat. I have been familiar with Natalie Pendergrass for a while. We're friends on Facebook and we've been sort of aware of each other. But recently she sent me a note describing some experiences that she's going through and she's very excited about improving or increasing awareness among the massage therapy community about this issue. Now, uh, full disclosure, I actually have done a couple of podcasts on this topic, but they are uh, pretty old. And so we thought it was a good time for an update, especially from the point of view of a person who has both received a lot of massage, but who has also been a massage therapist for 20 years. So I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, Natalie Pendergrass. And uh, Natalie, can you tell us a little bit about what you have been discovering? Sure. Um, Thank you, Ruth. And um, I have been discovering that living with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is a lot more complicated than it is given credit for. It is definitely considered an invisible illness. And um, there's a lot of people walking around the world with hypermobility that causes a lot of muscle pain and tension, depression, anxiety that um, is not seen in the way that it needs to be or respected in the way that it should be. Um, You know, oftentimes we're seen as just, you know, carrying on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I want you to talk about, you know, how people uh, uh, described you during your childhood, but I want to just interject for a moment, a little bit of technical information about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is also called EDS. This is a genetic condition or a group of genetic conditions. What did we say? 13 different types. Uh, Until recently, we really didn't know about all these different types. Now we have the advent of some genetic testing that allows us to be a little bit more refined. Unfortunately, as with all genetic disorders, finding it provides some answers, but those answers are not about effective treatment options. They're really more about how can we make adjustments in our lifestyle to living with this genetic condition, which in this case weakens the connective tissues. And so uh, Natalie's fascia and tendons and ligaments are more slack than you would find in someone who doesn't have EDS, and that puts her at risk for a number of different issues. So let's talk a little bit about your childhood. Yeah, so um, in my childhood, I realized, I don't know how I figured this out, but I realized I could partially dislocate my shoulders, and um, I would do that for the fun of it, for entertainment. I would tell people like, watch this, you know, and I have them put their, their finger <laughs> on my shoulder and I'd, I'd pop my shoulder out and their finger would sink into my shoulder and they'd be like, ew, gross. I'm like, wait, and I'd pop it back in and it'd pop their finger out and <laughs> they'd be grossed out and we'd all be entertained. And, um, and it wasn't until I was actually in the massage therapy program in uh, 2002, 2003, where we were studying shoulders that day. And I went up to the teacher on break and I said, okay, 
So I'm curious, I were telling my shoulders, what do you think it is I'm doing here? And I show him, he's like, wow. He's like, you're partially dislocating. And I was like, okay, that's what I thought. But yeah, he confirmed. And then I told a friend who also did PT and she said, yeah, stop doing it. And I realized, yeah, it was not a good <laughs> idea to continue doing um, into my adult life. <laughs> Um, I also had issues with like trying to run or like if I didn't warm up my ankles, they couldn't take any impact. I remember dropping off of the monkey bars one day and I only had about a foot to fall maybe and just collapsing. A scream collapsed because it felt like I broke my ankle and um, somebody picking me up, carrying me the nurse and then I was fine. And even as an adult, this still happens. If I need to run, I hopefully will have a chance to warm up my ankles because otherwise, like if I had to run across the street, I might drop in the middle of the street and, you know, I have hobbled the rest of the way like, <laughs> and I manage, but yeah, it's been an issue for a long time. So for your life, you have lived with this sort of general, um, let's, it's, you know, you're not fragile, but there is a sense of instability when you make sudden demands on your body. And you know what that tells us is that the muscles that are supporting your joints, they have to kick in in order to keep you from dislocating. And then you told me that early in adulthood, you went through a number of, of incidents with neck injuries. And so you had a lot of pain and that was sort of your introduction to massage? Yeah, um, in my early years of driving, I swear I was a car magnet for one year. I was rear-ended five times in one year. I swore I'd never buy another blue car because I think I just felt like blue just attracted other cars to drive into it. Um, and each time it happened, it would be like immediately. I was It was no big deal. It wasn't a big impact. And I'd go on about my day. By the end of the day or the next day and then weeks following, I was in excruciating pain. I could barely move my head. My neck just felt rigid and stuck. And that's what I've learned. That's the protective mechanism of this head's going to fall off, but the way it keeps moving. So tighten everything up is basically what my nervous system does. And and for good reason, because yeah. your nervous system isn't wrong in this in this case that that your joints need a little more external stabilization than someone who doesn't have EDS and who has not been through a series of car accidents. And so their ligaments are a little more functional. So you started receiving a lot of massage. You ended up in massage school. Can you talk to us a little bit about being a massage therapist with hypermobile joints? Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. So I'm really glad that right before I went to massage school, I had actually finished yoga teacher training. Because of what I learned in yoga before going into massage, I also learned how to move my body a lot better. So it was in yoga where like my teacher pointed out, do you see what you're, do you know what you're doing with your knee? Like stop doing that. And she pointed out that I had it hyperextended. And so I learned to straighten it. And she told me, you know, don't let it go there anymore. This is straight, hold it, it's straight. And so I've gotten really good at like stabilizing my knees. So I learned a lot in that class, you know, like, and if you hold your head back here, like the neck softens up, just all sorts of different things that helped me to function better. So it was, it was awesome. When then I started massage school, I just kind of kept that foundation in the back of my mind and it helped me to move better. You know, like I learned to not let my shoulder blades move up because if I put pressure on my hands, if I lean like you will on a client, it's very easy for my shoulder just to go up to my ear. But I had learned through yoga, like keep those shoulder blades down, engage the muscles, hold them there. And so when I'm practicing, I am constantly getting my own workout because I am holding my shoulder blades down and stabilizing and engaging everything in order to provide pressure to the client's body and not just receive it in my own joints. You know, I know enough people involved in manual therapies who have joint mobility. It might be interesting, you know, if at some point you did a class in using muscles to protect your joints while, you know, while being a massage therapist. If listeners are interested in such a thing, let me know and I'll hook you up with Natalie. And now I'd like, you know, I'd, well, I'd like you to talk, Natalie, about why you contacted me, why you think this is such an important thing to sort of bring to our consciousness and to put that in the context of what this means when we provide massage therapy for clients who might be somewhere on that spectrum between hypermobility that's more than we would expect and someone who really is at that frail end of EDS. Yeah. So when I initially was receiving massage, you know, I would go in with so much pain that I was the type of client that said, yes, yeah, stick your elbow in it because the pain you're giving me feels so much better than the pain I've been in. And I left 
generally feeling really good. Like, oh, I'm so relaxed. My muscles feel so much better. But unfortunately, what would happen is sometimes within the drive home, my neck would tighten up, especially my neck, um, probably is because I've had so many neck traumas. And, you know, you've got this 10 pound weight on the top of an unstable limb, <laughs> you know, and this unstable neck. So I kind of been doing that for a long time, unfortunately, since so I was in a rollover car accident in July of 21. And that took me almost two years to recover from. So we aren't quite at July yet. I was only released from care in the last four weeks. I went through PT with three different PTs, so they're doctors, and also saw a couple different chiropractors and did a lot of different stuff where I was always being improperly treated. Because even though I would say, I'm pretty sure I'm hypermobile, they'd just be like, okay, and just have me do the same things they were having everybody else do, which meant like improper movements and just exacerbating the issue. So in my research and in all this trying to recover, what I've realized that I really need is, yes, I need the muscles loosened up some, but it's more like they just need to be softened. They need that edge taken off. But if too much is taken off, you know, the muscles are put in too much of a state of weakness, fatigue, relaxation, then my nervous system will respond by getting tighter. So um, that's one big thing is, you know, when your client is hypermobile, understanding that they need some of that tension to stay in their body. You can't just try to alleviate it all because it will create more instability and their body will basically fight back in, in um, trying to prevent your, your limbs from falling off. The other thing is being careful of stretching clients. So I have told people, you know, I'm hypermobile and then sometimes they'll still be pulling my arm out and I'm literally on the table, like pulling it back in because I know that they will dislocate my shoulders. So my massage is not that relaxing when I am trying to keep my limbs attached while you're trying to pull them off. So, wow. <laughs> my goodness. So I do a lot less stretching with my clients. I do a lot of pin and stretch. I think that's a lot more useful where, you know, you can shorten up a muscle, pin it down, and then just give it a small range of motion. You know, it's a little movement to the joint instead of its full range of motion, because that's what I figured out is the biggest issue is don't put my joints to their full range of motion because it's way more than they should be going to. And so that's what a lot of therapists are looking for. And then they're just going, wow, wow, you're so flexible. Wow, I can move this so easy. I'm like, yeah, we just stop. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, flexibility is not always the desired outcome. It, 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 It is possible to take it too far. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I really appreciate what you say about about over treatment. And it's a drum I beat constantly, which is let's work for incremental improvements and check on how that gets incorporated, woven into the body during the times between massages. I I just don't trust those giant changes in one session because they tend to backfire. And I think for someone who lives with a nervous system that is telling their muscles that their, you know, their head's going to fall off, very, very important for us to respect that and to understand that that's there for a reason and to try to change it in one session is just not going to be helpful. Yeah. Right. Is there anything else that you would like to tell listeners about having Ehlers-Danlos or uh, working with clients who have Ehlers-Danlos? What's, the, what's your final sort of chance to wrap it up and take it away? Sure. Well, one thing I can say is definitely as a massage therapist, I've had therapists say to me, well, I don't need to work out. My my job is my workout. And that is one thing I discourage in anybody, even if you don't have hypermobility. But especially if you have hypermobility, if you have EDS, you have to exercise every day. You have to be doing core strengthening. You have to be doing things that are stabilizing your joints and you have to put that into practice every day at your table when you are working. You can't go into a day and, you know, just, just let it go because you will pay for that. And, you know, that, that'll end up meaning that you're not able to work. Um, I have figured out that I can only see so many clients in a day before at the end of the day, I can feel my spine, my vertebrae shifting back and forth because my muscles have now been fatigued and they can't hold it anymore. So I know that's that's as much as I can work in a day. And my work days have to be shortened because of that. So learning to honor your body, take care of it, do the exercises that are necessary, learn to stabilize your body. And yes, I do need to get that class written. <laughs> that would be wonderful. I do. I, I really am inspired now. So I want to put out the call to any massage therapist who feel like you're living with some level of hypermobility. Let's create a little bit of community and get you hooked up with Natalie, who has through bitter and but also sweet experience 
um, learned how to do this in an effective and sustainable way. Natalie, thanks again for reaching out to me with your experience. And I really appreciate um, the chance to uh, share that with our listeners. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to I Have a Client Who Pathology Conversations with Ruth Warner. Remember, you can send me your I Have a Client Who stories to I Have a Client Who at abmp.com. That's I Have a Client Who, all one word, all lowercase, at abmp.com. I can't wait to see what you send me, and I'll see you next time.